But in spiritual logic, there's no problem with both these statements being true, depending on how we look at it. Mm -hmm. okay, you follow so, me so far? Yeah. So you're saying that God and this emanation is one, and it is all God, and God and this emanation are separate, and his, his emanations are not God. Simultaneous. At the same time. Right. So it depends on how we look at it. Right? In the one sense, everything is God because He is everything. That's one definition of God, is the complete whole of everything that exists. But in another way of looking at it, there's a difference between the cause and the effect, between the source and the emanation. So you're making a distinction between... For, for this particular purpose, we need to make that distinction. Because if we don't, we get ourselves in trouble. Uh, what happens is we start using the energy of God for purposes that are different from God's. We start, this is called mental concoction. In the you can make that distinction without saying this is not God, right? Well, we say it's God's energy. But even when you say that, it is still God. In some ultimate sense it is, but it's God transformed. Okay? Like I was pointing out, the table doesn't manifest consciousness. Material objects don't, don't manifest consciousness, activity, sensitivity, responsiveness to the environment and stuff. They serve. Yeah, they're just like, use me. <laughs> they serve, let me serve you. They yeah. serve in this particular yeah. form that you created for. But if we, if we take that service and use it for our own purposes that are different from God's, then we also have to take the karma. See, that's the difference. If we take that energy and we use it for a purpose that's part of God's purpose, then it's cool, it's not karma. Yeah? From my own understanding, is this a proper analogy say that um, a cell in my body is not me, but it is, is, is like a piece of me? Not saying that like, I hope I don't get any karma for this, but say, as an example, I am God, and a cell is a person, or an object within that. The cell does not make up God, but is a piece of God. Exactly. That's okay. a really good analogy. Ben is saying, for you, for you guys online, that um, he's making the analogy that the whole I am the whole body. Uh, that's, that's me. Uh, yet, a cell within my body is actually different from me. It's a different living entity, a different life. So similarly, uh, the individual living beings are part of God, part of God's total existence, but yet they're not God in that they are separate independent entities. It's a really good analogy. And that's an analogy that I use that like every cell in the body, they do not compete with each other to try and be like the, the most popular cell or the most religious <laughs> cell. They all work you know, serving. Most popular cell. <laughs> they all work serving the body. I think they even work serving the But you know what I mean? Like they all work serving the body in, in okay. a common attempt. Now that's a really good, yeah, that's very good. Prabhupada used to give the analogy that the, the business of the hand is not to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the duty of the hand is to take the food and put it in the mouth. Right. And when the hand gives the food to the mouth, then the hand enjoys the energy of the food, mm -hmm. right, and can use it. But if the hand tries to eat the food itself, <laughs> <laughs> then it's not going to be successful, and ultimately the hand is going to starve. Right. Because it's not doing it. the hand. Huh? We don't glorify the hand. Well, we do. The hand is beautiful when it performs the function of giving the food to the mouth. See? Other, if, otherwise, if it tries to eat independently, then the hand is diseased. It's, it's not cooperating with the whole. So our business is to cooperate with the whole and to offer the, the energy of Krishna back to Krishna, energy of God back to God, and then by doing that service according to his purposes, not our purpose, not our concoction, but what he expresses in the scriptures as being his uh, purpose, when we use it for that, we have no karma. And that's how we get free from the unintended consequences of our actions. Tony, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, um, when is the appropriate way to offer food as 
Well, the most important thing is the intention. The intention. We have, you know, there's uh, information on the website about, you know, there's a little ceremony that's traditional in our lineage. Uh, but the most important thing is, you know, like, you just have a little picture and you put the food there and, or, you know, or even you have a picture in your mind. And the intention is, you know, here, God, this is your energy. Please enjoy it and let us take the remnant. Thank you very much. It's simple. It's very simple. But that simple action takes all the karmic reaction from the food. That simple offering. It doesn't have to be a big, big elaborate deal. Although in the temples, of course, we offer food very ceremoniously. But for, for us, the main thing is the concept. Consciousness. So the bottom line in all of our teachings, you find again and again and again, we talk about consciousness. Uh, the, the, the value of a spiritual teaching or practice is its effect on our consciousness. And, and many of the uh, teachings that we have, uh, that, that idea about you know, oneness and separation from God is another one like this. Uh, where the social consequences of the idea of being one with God are so terrible and so destructive that for that reason alone, we should reject that, that mood. Uh, because if we're all God and then we can do anything we want, then there's no laws, there's no right and wrong, there's no consequences. And then, yeah, it gets dicey real fast. <laughs> See? It's not, an intelligent person won't misuse that philosophy like that. But an, a person of less intelligence will see it as an opportunity for, for mayhem. So there is a way to allow God to just express his, his purposes through you as oh, an expression of God. Absolutely. That's we want why that. we're here in individual. That's, yeah. yeah, we it's want that. It's a big part of being human. That's, yeah, and it's also a big part of being in spiritual consciousness and yeah. doing bhakti yoga. You know, it's like, we, we're always checking in. I'm always checking in with Krishna. Like, okay, what do you want me to do now? What do you want me to say now? You know, letting him actually take over my body and operate my senses and mind. You know, it's a lot easier that way. <laughs> and the, way to get your purpose yeah, the product is better too. You know? <laughs> but, so uh, in that way we are God. In that way we are. Right. We're linked with God, mm -hmm. right? But see, a person that takes a certain amount of discrimination to understand that, a certain amount of intelligence. And people who don't have that intelligence, they'll take it in a different way. Oh my God, that means I can rob that bank I've been looking at, you know? <laughs> I haven't thought that once. <laughs> no, no, you wouldn't think it. Right. Huh? But there's a certain class of people who always will misuse that philosophy in that way. So therefore, we, we have to present these ideas with great discretion. Uh, not like, see, Sankaracharya, Sankaracharya who, who originated this idea that it's all one, you know, we are all God and all this. Um, he himself was a completely renounced monk. You know, I mean, he, he never had sex in his life. He was completely pure. Right? But then the people who took it up who, who took that philosophy and ran with it, they had many other motives, okay? They wanted to be excused from the rules and regulations of spiritual life so that they could do the kind of activities that they wanted to do. So they clarity, wanted to imitate God. Right. So clarity needed to happen. So that right. more, and more understanding needed to be given. Yes. So that they were educated and knowledgeable rather than because anyone can take any idea, any philosophical idea, and make anything they want of it. That of doesn't course. mean that we say, you know, oh, no, <laughs> this isn't true, you know. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, so there's a simultaneous, inconceivable oneness and difference with God. That's our philosophy, actually. It's even called, it's even called that. Our philosophy in the esoteric teaching is called... Uh, I keep I want to write it in Sanskrit. Achintya, which means inconceivable. Bheda, which means different. 
आभेर अर्थात Achintya bheda bheda tattva means simultaneous, inconceivable oneness and difference with God. This is a very sophisticated idea. This is, this is not for beginners. <laughs> so we, we present this idea very carefully. And we try to give the background. So what today is going to be about is the background of these ideas and practices, and especially the background of astrology. How are you guys doing online? Okay, any more questions before we go on?